The story we're going to talk about today is a horrifying and technically unsolved murder that rocked the affluent town of Greenwich, Connecticut to its core. On the evening of October 30th, 1975, Martha Moxley, a popular 15-year-old girl who lived with her parents, Dorothy and David, and brother John, was discovered dead in the backyard of her family's home with severe injuries. Injuries so severe, she was hardly recognizable. Welcome to 10-Minute Murder. My name is Joe, I'm the host, and thank you for joining today. I'm super excited that you decided to listen to this podcast. Out of all of the podcasts that you could be listening to, or anything else in your life that you could be doing, you're spending time with 10-Minute Murder, and I really, truly appreciate it. I was uh, chatting with Mark, who is a listener of this podcast, and someone that I would consider a, a true crime friend. We've talked about a lot of different things. Um... We were talking about how my voice is so much different when I was sick and I was struggling to breathe and, and still trying to do this podcast versus how I sound now, which I think I'm back to normal. This is the longest like duration of time that I've been sick. Usually I'll get sick and I'll get over it very quickly and then, you know, everything's back to normal. But this time it's been a couple of months and I still have like a, I've got the sniffles a little bit and I do have allergies, which compounds issues like nobody's business. It, it usually doesn't last this long. But aside from that, I am fully back to my old self, I think. I'm pretty sure. Knock on wood. I don't know if my desk is even real wood. I could have just jinxed myself. All right, before we get going with your story today, this is your reminder to subscribe. If you're a new listener to 10 Minute Murder, when you become a subscriber, you will always be sure that you'll see all the episodes immediately when you open the app. They'll automatically download, and uh, you can also connect with 10-Minute Murder on social media. Links for connecting are in the show notes of this episode. If you have friends and you think that they might be into true crime stories like this one, brief and bingeable, please let them know about this podcast. Links from the show notes, as I mentioned, as well as at 10MinuteMurder.com. Now, to today's story. Martha Elizabeth Moxley was born in San Francisco, California on August 16, 1960, and she died on October 30, 1975. She was a 15-year-old Greenwich, Connecticut high school student. The Skakel family, who you're going to hear a lot about in the next few minutes, was another family living in the Bell Haven community. Two Skakel boys, 15-year-old Michael and 17-year-old Tommy, became acquainted with Martha Moxley. It wasn't uncommon to see Martha talking to and hanging out with various kids in the neighborhood, including the Skakel brothers. On the evening of October 30th, 1975, Martha Moxley left with several friends to take part in Mischief Night. That is the day before Halloween. And if you're not familiar with Mischief Night, well, the name should give it away itself. A time when young people in the neighborhood would play tricks or pranks on others, like ding-dong ditch, toilet papering trees, and this was well before you needed to take out a second mortgage to buy a carton of eggs, so kids would take those cheap eggs and throw them at houses, cars, each other. I think you get the point of Mischief Night. After Martha was killed and during the investigation, Martha's friends said that she had been making out with Michael Skakel's older brother, Thomas. Around 9.30 p.m., Martha and Thomas were last seen together behind a fence next to the pool in the Skakel backyard. But Thomas's younger brother, Michael, is the one that we need to talk about at this point. How does he fit into the story? Michael Christopher Skakel, the fifth of seven children, was born on September 19, 1960. His parents are Rushton and Ann Skakel. Michael started abusing alcohol after his mother passed away in 1973 from a brain cancer. Due to his subpar academic standing, he was expelled from school. Not one school. Not five schools. He was booted from 12 schools. As it relates to that, I think it's worth noting that Michael Skakel, years later, was diagnosed with having dyslexia. No doubt that played a role in his poor grades at the time. 
All right, so back to Mischief Night, or more accurately, the next morning of Mischief Night. Martha Moxley's body was found in her own backyard, covered by branches from a tree. Her pants and panties were pulled down, but investigators believe this may be due to being dragged. A shattered six-iron golf club was discovered, broken into pieces close to Martha's body. According to an autopsy, she had been clubbed with it and stabbed with it. It was determined that the golf club had come from the Skakel home. On the night of the murder, Thomas Skakel was the last person seen with Moxley. Naturally, he became the prime suspect. His father, though, put up roadblocks, forbidding access by investigators to Thomas's medical history as well as academic records. It feels like equal parts protective father and someone with something maybe to hide. Kenneth Littleton, who had just started working as a live-in tutor for the Skakel family, was another suspect that detectives were looking into. However, no one was put on trial or formally charged at this time, and the murder went semi-stagnant for years. Over time, Thomas and Michael, the Skakel brothers, made significant changes to their accounts of what transpired on Mischief Night, the night of Martha Moxley's murder. Michael claimed that he had been window-peeping and having sex under a tree close to the Moxley home from 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m. However, Michael confessed to a friend that he killed Moxley with a golf club and it was overheard by two former students of the troubled juvenile treatment center, Elon School. And that's according to later testimony in court. Former student Gregory Coleman claimed that Michael received special treatment and bragged about getting away with literal murder. There was a rumor that William Kennedy Smith had been at the Skakel house on the night of Moxley's death, obviously hinting that he might have been involved in the case when it was reopened. And if that name sounds familiar, William Kennedy Smith was very publicly tried for rape in 1991, but found not guilty. That story gained a lot of attention because he's a member of the Kennedy family, a nephew of John F. Kennedy. Even though the rumor is untrue, it forced a fresh look at an old case. The protective father, Rushton Skakel, employed the Sudden Associates, a private investigation company, to investigate the murder in 1991, a move that may have backfired on him. It turns out that both Thomas and Michael lied about their actions on the night of the murder, according to the Sudden Report, which was eventually leaked to the media. After the investigation, a seldom utilized one-person grand jury was called in June 1998 to examine the case's supporting documentation. It was decided that there was enough evidence to charge Michael Skakel with the murder after an 18-month inquiry. A warrant for the arrest of an unnamed person concerning the killing of Moxley was issued on January 9, 2000. Later that day, Skakel turned himself into the police. He was soon granted a $500,000 bond and released. Because Skakel was 15 when Martha Moxley was killed, he was initially charged with murder in a juvenile court on March 14th. On January 31st, the next year, Skakel was informed that an adult trial would be held. On May 7th, 2002, the Michael Skakel trial began in Norwalk, Connecticut. Attorney Michael Sherman represented him. Skakel's testimony... His explanation for his absence during the time of the murder was that he was visiting his cousin. During a segment of a taped book proposal shown to the jury during the trial, Michael Skakel mentioned masturbating in a tree on the night of the murder. I mentioned the peeping Tom claims earlier, but is this a admit to something embarrassing and disgusting so that they don't suspect you of doing something evil and disgusting scenario? Also, it's possible that the tree under which Moxley's body was found the following morning was the same tree Skakel claimed to be in. During closing arguments, the prosecution used sentences from the book proposal and superimposed them on graphic images of Moxley's corpse in a computerized multimedia display shown to the jury. Skakel revealed on the audio tape that he had become anxious because he believed that he might have been seen going to town on himself the previous night. And that's not the term down the tape that he used, though. He said jerking off. And even though the jury heard the complete audio tape during the closing arguments, the prosecutor did not play the part where Skakel said jerking off, giving the impression that he was confessing to the murder. 
sounding like he said he was anxious because he believed he might have been seen. Period. On June 7, 2002, Michael Skakel was found guilty of killing Martha Moxley. On August 30, 2002, he was given a life sentence. His age at the time was 41. He was assigned to the Gardner Correctional Facility in Newtown, Connecticut. Skakel's original appeal addressed the prosecution's use of multimedia during closing arguments. Michael Skakel's defense team persisted in trying to prove his innocence. Michael's former classmates, a guy named Tony Bryant, informed Michael's legal representatives on August 24, 2003, that two of Michael's friends, who were there at Bell Haven the night of Martha Moxley's murder, confessed to killing her. When Michael Skakel's defense team learned about Tony Bryant's account, they requested a new trial. The judge denied the appeal. Fast forward to September 27, 2010. In a new appeal, Michael Skakel's legal team argued that his trial attorney, Mickey Sherman, did not present a compelling case. Skakel's new attorney, Hubert Santos, asserted that Sherman should have spoken with witness Dennis Osorio, who could vouch for Michael's presence at Jimmy Terrian's house at the time when Martha was supposedly murdered. In 2013, a Connecticut judge requested a new trial for Michael Skakel after finding that his initial defense counsel had not effectively represented him. After spending more than 11 years in solitary confinement, Michael was released from prison. The Supreme Court in Connecticut upheld Michael Skakel's murder conviction on December 30, 2016. His trial attorney was found to be competent by the court. Just two years later, the Connecticut Supreme Court overturned its 2016 judgment and overruled Michael Skakel's conviction on May 4, 2018. On October 30, 2020, 45 years after the murder of Martha Moxley, the state of Connecticut announced that Michael Skakel would not be retried. And that is where it stands today. Now, I think it's important to remember that justice was never fully served for Martha Moxley and her family. This case is still active, and I have no doubt that if you have pertinent information, Greenwich, Connecticut law enforcement would like to hear from you.